Ted Bundy, a new type of killer. Theodore Robert Bundy died on Florida's electric chair, guilty of a series of crimes so grotesque and evil in nature that his interviewers would sometimes vomit after speaking with him. He was a man of a dozen faces and a dozen versions of the truth, none of which ever quite matched up. He is confirmed to have raped, mutilated, bludgeoned, and strangled to death 20 women, though he confessed to having killed 30. Experts believe Bundy's true body count to in fact be in the hundreds, with victims ranging in the age from as young as eight years old. The first murderer in history to be called a serial killer. We take a deep dive into Ted Bundy's life, his motives, his murders, and the widely improbable story that linked all three together. Young Theodore, which of Ted's many childhoods was true? So far on Memoirist, we've covered men and women whose lives helped to shape history, from Stalin's Russia to Queen Elizabeth's England. Some of the figures we've discussed did evil things, whilst others were courageous. In every case, their stories have been fairly straightforward to tell. When it comes to Theodore Bundy, the most notorious serial killer in American history, however, things are different. Bundy was a narcissist, and most likely a psychopath too. He lied pathologically, spinning different narratives to suit different purposes. Unfortunately, because of this, it has become impossible to separate the truth of Bundy's childhood from the fiction he later presented. Nevertheless, here is what we know. Theodore Robert Bundy was born on November 24, 1946, to Louise Cowell at the Elizabeth Lund Home for Unwed Mothers in Burlington, Vermont. Back in 1946, it was a big deal for young women to give birth out of wedlock, and so, with no father in sight, young Theodore spent the first three years of his life being raised by his maternal grandparents, Samuel and Eleanor. Only thing was, Theodore was told that Sam and Eleanor were his mother and father, and that his biological mother, Louise, was in fact his sister. This deception would prove a key breaking point in his psyche later in life. Most sources close to young Theodore would later claim that he lived in a quiet, normal, loving home and was of average popularity in school. Yet according to Ted, this was not the case. Presented as excuses for his criminal pathology, Bundy would later state that the man he knew as his father, actually his grandfather Samuel, was a violent drunk who beat his wife and his dog, was racist, homophobic, a misogynist, and xenophobic, and would even swing neighborhood cats around by their tails. Though classmates at Woodrow Wilson High School in Tacoma, Washington, to which Bundy and Louise moved in 1950, described young Theodore as well-known and well-liked, Ted claimed to the contrary, I didn't know what made people want to be friends. Ted's disturbing behaviors began to exhibit themselves whilst he was still young. One day, when Ted was three years old, his Aunt Julia awoke from a nap to find herself surrounded by kitchen knives, with Ted standing, smiling next to her bed. Later, at a Boy Scout camp, as Ted's childhood friend Sandy Colt recalls, Bundy built a tiger trap in the woods, a concealed pit filled with sharpened stakes, into which a young girl fell and had her legs sliced open. As a teenager, Ted confessed to getting extremely drunk in order to follow local girls, or spy into neighbors' windows to try and catch women changing. He also developed an obsession with hardcore pornography and began to fantasize about sex or rape, which included extreme violence. Though never confirmed, it is believed that Ted's first murder victim was eight-year-old Anne-Marie Burr, whose house was on Bundy's paper route. Anne-Marie disappeared from her home when Ted was just 14, and her father claims he saw Ted in a ditch at a construction site the morning she disappeared. However, the girl's body was never recovered. By the time Ted reached college, he had been arrested at least twice by Washington State Police 
on suspicion of burglary and grand theft auto. Turning Point, College Romance, Republicanism, and Bundy's Birth Certificate. According to Anne Rule, a former colleague of Bundy's and a police officer, as well as Detective Robert Cappell, Ted Bundy most likely became a killer in his teenage years. Bundy himself stated that he had graduated from his status as an amateur and impulsive killer to that of a prime predator by the time he was 27. Nevertheless, it was his college years which precipitated his switch to a more organized, deliberate pattern of killing, and which gave him the intellect and background he would hide behind for the rest of his life. Graduating high school in 1965, Bundy first attended the University of Puget Sound before taking a degree in Chinese at the University of Washington. There he met the person whom the next 11 years of his brutalization of women would ultimately be about. Diane Edwards, a young, white, wealthy and attractive woman with middle parted dark hair began going out with Ted Bundy sometime in 1967. Diane was Ted's first girlfriend, and he fell madly in love, not only with her, but with her status and wealth as an upper middle class socialite. Inspired by Diane to do something with his life, Ted dropped out of college and began volunteering for the Republican Party. A die-hard Nixonite, Bundy believed his sociopathic charm could win him favor and position on the political ladder. However, Ted would soon find out that he was not quite the Lothario he took himself to be. Working a series of minimum wage jobs, Bundy had little to no money and had even less direction in life. Diane, seeing this, stopped responding to his letters, eventually breaking up with the soon-to-be most wanted man in America. At this time, Bundy states that he fell into a blackness during which he can remember nothing except a desire to exact revenge upon Diane. To do so, he made a plan. Theodore re-enrolled at UW to study psychology. Though his SATs were disappointingly low, he was subsequently able to attend Seattle Law School in 1973, based on letters of recommendation provided by Republican Governor Daniel J. Evans and chairman of the Washington State Republican Party, Ross Davis. At this point, he got back in contact with Diane, who was impressed by his transformation. Ted began dating her again and eventually asked her to marry him. However, almost as soon as the pair got engaged, Bundy cut all contact. When Diane finally got through to him to demand why he'd shut her out, he said quite calmly, Diane, I have no idea what you mean. Later, the cripplingly shallow and emotionally fragile Bundy would admit, I just wanted to prove to myself that I could have married her. Having taken his revenge on his ex-girlfriend, Bundy dropped out of university for a second time. Around this point in his life, he also discovered his true parentage by seeking out his birth certificate. The revelation that his family were not who they told him they were, combined with his insufferable heartbreak, have been seen by most Bundy experts as the turning points in his psyche. By April of 1974, young women who bore striking resemblances to Diane Edwards began to disappear all across the state of Washington. The very definition of heartless evil, Ted Bundy's crimes. Ted Bundy was no ordinary killer. Up until this point in criminal history, there'd been no one quite like him. He was organized, intelligent, extremely egotistical, and absolutely merciless, acting without so much as a glimmer of empathy for his victims or their families. His violence began when he was young, and from the outset was directed solely towards women. By Bundy's own admission, his assault of women and eventually his rapes and murders were motivated first and foremost by the need to possess them. In essence, he said, he killed for the same reason he stole. I really enjoyed having something that I had wanted and gone out and taken. The ultimate possession was, in fact, the taking of a life. And then, the physical possession of the remains. The victim becomes a part of you, and you two are forever one. And the grounds where you kill them or leave them become sacred to you 
and you will always be drawn back to them. According to Marcus Parks of the last podcast on the left fame, Bundy stands out from other serial killers for two reasons. Firstly, when recounting his crimes later in life, he was able to recall them in perfect detail. Whereas most serial killers lock these memories away. Secondly, Bundy was an expert at ensuring no evidence whatsoever was left at any crime scene. His fingerprints were never found, nor were his victims' clothes. Only on a couple of occasions were hairs or other fibers found, yet none were conclusive enough to convict him. Similarly, Bundy perfected his own cruel methods of seduction and murder. He would typically approach young females in some sort of disguise, either as a person of authority, such as a police officer or fireman, or feigning injury with crutches and casts quite brazenly often in broad daylight and targeting multiple people in one day. He would ask his victims for help, usually with carrying something to his car. Once there, Ted would beat the women unconscious, most often using a tire iron or crowbar he had stashed near his light brown VW Beetle. Only in his early killings, when Bundy was younger and less disciplined, or later when he was a fugitive on the run, did he defer from his technique and instead break into women's homes or college dorms to assault them in their beds. One of the most infamous and terrible of such incidents was his attack on the Chi Omega sorority house at Florida State University, where, in just 15 minutes, the serial killer took the lives of two women and brutally assaulted two more. Typically, however, once Bundy had his victims unconscious and handcuffed on the back seat of his car, he would drive them to a previously chosen location, the woods or mountains, or occasionally his apartment or hotel room. Once there, Ted would unleash the full extent of his monstrous evil upon these innocent, unsuspecting, and vulnerable young girls. He would beat them with blunt objects and shatter their bones. He would bite their buttocks or breasts, in one case to the point of almost severing a nipple from the body. Bundy might then sexually assault these women with other objects. During the attack on Chi Omega, he forcibly inserted a hairspray bottle into 20-year-old Lisa Levy, with such violence that he ruptured her internal organs. That same night, Bundy broke into FSU student Cheryl Thomas's apartment, dislocated her shoulder, and fractured her skull and jaw in five places before ejaculating. The man they'd come to call the very definition of heartless evil, most often then killed his victims by strangulation with a pair of stockings. In almost every case of assault and murder, Ted Bundy would also rape the women, sometimes before he killed them, but most often afterwards, in acts of necrophilia. He told law enforcement officers later in life that he often revisited the corpses of his victims, which he would stash on his favorite hiking trails, so that he could have sex with their bodies, only stopping when decomposition made this impossible. Some of his favorite post-mortem rituals involved dressing the corpses, shampooing their hair, applying makeup and painting their nails. On at least a dozen occasions, Bundy elected to remove the heads of his victims with a hacksaw. He kept at least four heads, probably those of Susan Rancourt, Roberta Parks, Brenda Ball, and Linda Healy, in his apartment as trophies. Whilst America's most notorious serial killer often targeted college-age girls and women, he was fond of younger girls as well. His longtime girlfriend, Elizabeth Kloepfer's daughter, Molly, stated that, starting at the age of seven, Bundy would hit her, expose himself to her, and sexually assault her by touching her inappropriately. Perhaps the most tragic case of Bundy's crimes were the assault, rape, and murder of two 12-year-old girls, Lynette Dawn Culver and Kimberly Diane Leach, the latter of whom he abducted from school and for whose murder he would eventually receive the electric chair. Though Bundy can be categorically linked to the rape and murder of 20 women, he himself confessed to 30 across several different states, from Washington to Oregon and Michigan to Florida. He even hinted that his actual body count may be well above 100, which many experts believe it is. 
Reverend Fred Lawrence, who administered Bundy's last rites, once stated, I don't even think he knew how many he killed or why he killed them. Escape, police incompetence, and Bundy's many arrests. Ted Bundy was actively murdering young women from at least 1971 until 1978, though he may well, as we've said, have been taking lives from as early as 1961. Yet for much of his killing spree, he managed to successfully evade the authorities. The question is, how? The answer is twofold. On one hand, Bundy was a relatively handsome, well-spoken, well-educated, middle-class white man with a sense of humor and an easy wit, though he liked to think that he managed to avoid capture due to his superior intellect and skill. I think in reality, he evaded the law simply because his extreme privilege was a mask he could easily hide behind. In a racist, classist legal system, Bundy just didn't fit the profile of a mass murderer. Following the abduction and double murder of two young women from Lake Sammamish National Park in King County, Washington, four separate people recognized witness descriptions of the suspect, his car, and profile. All four, Ted's girlfriend, Kloepfer, two ex-colleagues, and a former UW psychology professor, reported Bundy to King County Police. The police, however, ignored their warnings. They simply didn't think that a clean-cut law student like Ted could be the perpetrator, and so he went free. On the other hand, Ted Bundy knew how to play the system. In the mid-1970s, partly due to his connections with the Republican Party, Bundy ironically began working on the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Commission, where he authored a pamphlet for women on rape prevention. Later that decade, he switched to working at the Department of Emergency Services, or DES, where he was involved in the state government search for missing women. Through both of these roles, Ted came to learn that law enforcement in the 70s was not only slow, it was also strictly localized. Enforcement agencies barely shared information on suspects and crimes from county to county, let alone from state to state. Armed with this knowledge, Ted evaded capture by moving to a new place whenever the heat from his latest spree grew too much. Over the course of his killings, Bundy moved from Washington to Oregon, Utah, Colorado, and finally to Florida. Eventually, of course, he was apprehended. During a routine traffic stop in Utah on the 16th of August, 1975, Officer Bob Hayward discovered Bundy's VW Beetle to contain a ski mask, a mask made from pantyhose, a crowbar, a pair of handcuffs, a rope, an ice pick, and trash bags. Back at the station, Detective Jerry Thompson recalled Bundy an attempted kidnapping from the year before. After being identified in a lineup by Carol Deronge, the woman who had escaped Bundy's clutches, Ted stood trial and was found guilty of kidnapping and assault. He was sentenced to 1 to 15 years in the Utah State Penitentiary. Unfortunately, this would be but the first of a series of arrests before Ted Bundy was finally stopped. The first of Bundy's infamous escapes from custody came during a preliminary hearing at Pitkin County Courthouse in Aspen, Colorado. Because he had elected to defend himself, the judge excused him from wearing handcuffs or shackles. Whilst left unattended in the courthouse's law library, Bundy leapt from the second-story window and fled into the surrounding mountains. Only after six days of hunger and exposure did a delirious and emaciated Bundy return to Aspen and to jail. But the killer wouldn't rest. Back in Garfield County Jail, Bundy began acquiring the tools for his next great escape attempt. These included a hacksaw blade, blueprints of the jail, and $500 in cash from his new girlfriend, Carol Ann Boone, whom he had met whilst working at the DES. Bundy sawed a single square foot hole in the ceiling of his cell, starved himself until he was thin enough to fit through, and then began practicing his escape. On the night of December 30th, 1976, when most of the jail staff were on holiday, 
Bundy snuck through the hole in his cell into the chief jailer's apartment upstairs. He stole some of the jailer's clothes, who was out to dinner with his wife, and walked right out the front door. Before anyone knew he was missing, over 17 hours later, Bundy was halfway to Florida, just a week after his arrival in Tallahassee in January 1978, he perpetrated the infamous assault on the women of Chi Omega. Just three and a half weeks after that, he committed his last heinous offense in the kidnapping, rape, and murder of schoolgirl Kimberly Diane Leach. Finally, in debt, paranoia, and far from home, on February 12th, 1978, Ted Bundy was arrested during yet another traffic stop. This time, on his way to jail, he mumbled to his arresting officer, I wish you had killed me. Unveiling the sociopath, Ted Bundy on trial. Theodore Bundy's Florida trials, first for the murder and assault of the Chi Omega sorority sisters, and secondly for the murder and rape of 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, were to become some of the biggest public spectacles of all time. Owing to the nature of his crimes, as well as the fact that Bundy was the first human in history to be called a serial killer, his trials were set to be televised nationwide for the first time. Oddly, despite having never completed his law degree and thus not being a practicing lawyer, Bundy elected to represent himself in both trials, first as co-counsel and then entirely on his own. Polly Nelson, a member of his final defense team, stated the following. He sabotaged the entire defense effort out of spite, distrust, and grandiose delusion. Ted was facing murder charges with a possible death sentence, and all that mattered to him was that he be in charge. Over the course of court proceedings, Bundy did several strange and unfathomable things, including exhibiting a sickening fascination with the mold of his teeth, which matched the bite marks on the buttocks of a Chi Omega victim. The most outlandish and disturbing of Bundy's interjections, however, was when he, the defendant, suddenly chose to cross-examine the police officer who had been first on the scene at Chi Omega. Bundy asked the officer to recount in vivid detail how the bodies of his victims had looked when the police first found them. In fact, Bundy pushed for details of the murder scene to the point that the judge had to stop him from repeating himself. Ultimately, based on evidence gathered at the crime scenes, combined with Bundy's creepy demeanor and the evident sadistic joy he derived from reliving the crimes, the jury and judge found him guilty on all accounts of first-degree murder, kidnapping, assault, and rape. Despite a heartfelt plea from his mother, Ted was sentenced to three separate death penalties and was transferred to Florida State Prison to await his end. Death Row Confessions – The Mind of a Serial Killer Many people over the years have tried to diagnose Ted Bundy in an attempt to get to the root of what turned him into one of the most vicious, merciless, and evil killers in all of human history. And yet, to this day, no one diagnosis has managed to quite capture the truth of America's first serial killer. He's been called bipolar. He's been said to have multiple personality disorder, with several witnesses claiming Bundy would inexplicably change before their eyes, a transformation which included his irises turning jet black. Other psychiatrists stated that, rather than psychoses, Bundy exhibited traits more commonly associated with antisocial personality disorder, or ASPD. ASPD patients are often called sociopaths or psychopaths. Charming and charismatic people who have no genuine personality beneath the surface, who know the difference between right and wrong, but don't care either way, and who exhibit a complete lack of guilt and empathy. Indeed, psychopathy seemed to fit Ted Bundy most closely. After evaluation, using the Psychopathy Checklist revised, PCLR, Bundy scored a 39 out of 40. At the end of the day, however, we may dispense with such labels. His crimes speak for themselves. In fact, as death drew nearer for Bundy, he began to speak more openly as well. 
In confession tapes, which he recorded during interviews with journalist Stephen McCauld and Hugh Ainsworth, and later with Special Agent William Hagmeyer of the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit, Ted Bundy spoke in graphic detail about his crimes and the motivations behind them. It was during these interviews that he spoke of how he felt the compulsion to possess women, first through assaulting them, then through sexual assault, and eventually through murder and the possession of their remains. In order to commit such bone-chilling acts, Bundy confessed that he needed to be extremely drunk because only alcohol could significantly diminish his inhibitions and sedate the dominant personality within him, which he feared would prevent his inner entity from fulfilling his true desires. It was also during these interviews that he first admitted to having sex with the corpses of his victims, up until the point at which putrefaction made sex impossible. He recalled murder scenes and scenes of body disposal in crystal clear detail, said Detective Robert Keppel. Almost like he was just there, he was just totally consumed with murder all the time. Misogyny, or the hatred of women, was of course also a prime motivator in Bundy's crimes, including more specifically a hatred for his first girlfriend, Diane Edwards, who resembled almost all of his victims. Deeper still, I believe there was a sense of shame, embarrassment, and failure which he felt towards himself, and which he tried to overcome through his control of others. In a final letter to his longtime girlfriend, Elizabeth Kloepfer, Bundy wrote about his victims. Their facial expressions say, I am afraid of you. These people invite abuse. By expecting to be hurt, do they subtly encourage it? Finally, at 7.16 a.m. on Tuesday, 24th of January, 1989, Ted Bundy was put to death by electric chair. A room of witnesses observed his final moments. He looked white as a sheet, said one. Outside, over 2,000 Florida State University alumni, among other men and women, set off fireworks, got drunk, and chanted, Burn, Bundy, burn. To this day, there remain anywhere between 10 and 100 unidentified female victims of Ted Bundy, America's first and most notoriously evil serial killer. We can only hope that their families know peace.